So how are you? Tell me about Savvy Learning and everything you've been doing. Yeah, uh, I'm great. <laughs> and uh, Savvy Learning is uh, an online learning platform. We try to help kids, especially we started with reading. We added math. So these core subjects that a lot of kids fall behind early on. And, you know, if you fall behind your peers and you notice it, these mm -hmm. kids notice it, you start to go downhill fast. It's hard to catch up. Um, schools have a lot of ways that they try to help kids. But still, and when we started the business, I had no idea. Two thirds of kids never really catch up. Like by the end of third grade, they're not reading at a proficient <clears throat> level. Um, you 70. can determine a lot, right? By the third grade reading level. Yeah. It's kind of like you have to learn to read and then you read to learn beyond that. And so that's a really important spot. And when I learned that two thirds of kids were not there, that's two thirds. It's not one third, it's two thirds, 66% of our kids across the nation. And that's, you know, there that it, it doesn't matter socioeconomic status, like that's across the board, just that there's a lot of kids that struggle. So my uh, co-founder and I saw that and we were like, yeah, we need to help solve this. And that's how Savvy Learning came to be. Um, so yeah, it's going well. We're, we've been now, it's four years since we uh, launched right after COVID. And uh, it's been kind of a wild ride and, and super fun. So what is, what is the product exactly? So we provide four days of 25 minute class sessions a week, Monday through Thursday. So 25 minutes to keep it short and sweet, but very consistent. And these class sessions are highly engaging at the right level for every learner. They can be one-on-one, -on -one, but they can also be um, group up to four learners. So the goal is always to meet the, the learner, the reader, or the mathematician where they are so that it's engaging to them. We think a lot about flow and engagement. And if if you're out of that, if you're struggling, if you're overwhelmed, or if it's boring, you're not learning. It really needs to be right in that level where you're learning. And if that's the case day after day, then kids make progress. Yeah, that that's incredible. How's it going? Like, are you seeing some good traction from it? I imagine COVID was, in a weird way, maybe even good time to launch something like this. You know, we're, we're unclear whether it was good or bad, uh, good in the sense that there was a lot of clarity for parents to realize, oh, things are not in hand. I need to help. You know, it's not just on the schools to teach my kids. Like I need to figure out what's going to work for my kids. Bad in the sense that it was such a bad online experience for so many kids and their parents mm -hmm. that. They're like, we don't want more online learning. Mm -hmm. And so you come in with an online learning program that's meant to, that's actually purpose built to engage and to make it uh, work. And some people are very skeptical because of that experience. So yeah, it, it was an interesting time to start, certainly. Um, right before AI became big too. So yeah. then the question is always, you know, how much are we leveraging technology, generative AI and things to kind of help in that teaching process? But we have live coaches. They're delightful. The best coaches that we can find, you know, we hire less than 10% of the coaches that we, that get applications for, from. And that delightful engagement at the right level is what kids want, especially like at the elementary school age, mm -hmm. right? Like, you can kind of say, okay, high schoolers, college age kids, they kind of know how to learn. They can leverage the internet, mm -hmm. right? Uh, and now AI, chat GPT, et cetera, to kind of learn on their own to some degree. Although if you use it as a crutch, it can be bad um, yeah. for actually learning, learning skills. But um, for kids, when they're trying to learn to read or do math, I mean, this is just an overwhelming thing to try to yeah. do it alone. So a human touch is, is really nice. Yeah, that is interesting. So um, what have you learned about the school system in all of this? Like what, how, how are, how is our education system right now? It doesn't look like it's doing well if two thirds of kids. Well, 
the interesting thing about the education system, and by the way, we're B2C. So we, we're a supplemental, we're outside of it. We help yeah. homeschoolers, we help um, kids after school or before school. We very much see ourselves as kind of supplementing and helping standalone program that you can use without school, but um, in addition to school for many children. So we don't work directly with schools, but what we think about schools is that there are tons of amazing people trying to make schools work from administrators to staff to teachers who are bearing the brunt of the load. And over time, teachers have just had to do more and more and, and get paid less and less. Yeah. And they're all dealing with and working with and trying to help, you know, tens of students, 20, 30 students in a classroom. And sometimes they have aides and sometimes they have reading specialists that will come in and help certain students. But it's just a, a very difficult thing to cater to the individual needs of each student when you're dealing with that many kids. Yeah. So we have very positive feelings toward all the people in the system. And we recognize the challenges that the system has. Mm -hmm. So our, our, you know, our goal has always been, let's see how we can help solve the underlying problem and, and underlying problem. You could say, well, go solve the system. Most ed tech companies are doing that. Mm -hmm. They're going in and they're saying, Hey, we've got a new software solution to help with, you know, all these different things that teachers do. Um, we think that that's one great way to do it. But if 90% of companies are in that space trying to do that, then we want to be in the 10% that are saying, okay, well, let's help actually solve the problem that the kids and parents are having now. And then hopefully over time that can spread, yeah. you know, our solution. Um, or, or we can at least help where we can. Yeah. Yeah. That, have you raised money? Have we made money? Have you raised money? Oh, raised money. <laughs> have you made money? <laughs> Luckily we're making money. Uh, <laughs> I guess that's actually also a good question, but, uh, yeah. Have you raised, have you taken venture capital? You know, we grew really fast at first. Um, the first year we passed a million in ARR and we were like, we need a raise. We need to just crush it. We raised just a million in uh, friends and family mo money. And after that, we kind of noticed that we're on the edge of kind of being in that let's go raise and crush it versus like, if we raise and crush it, we might be overvaluing ourselves in a big raise and mm -hmm. hard to keep up. A lot of that depends on the scalability of our, you know, offering. And um, to date, we haven't, what we've noticed is like there's these step steps, you know, stepping these big steps in marketing and, and revenue mm -hmm. generation. And we haven't come across this perfect fit yet of driving revenue at scale, um, highly predictably. Mm. So we're doing well, we're a profitable company in the multi millions, but we, I'm, I'm very much a lean kind of bootstrappy guy. And I just don't want to sign up for the, uh, treadmill of, you know, series A, series B, series yeah. C funding that we rely on to keep the team in place and everything until I'm very confident that there's a pretty solid path to make all of those funds very efficient. Yeah. And that's where, you know, so every year we revisit we say, should we raise, should we do this? Where are we? Um, but it's, it's a time right now in the market where it actually is like, well, Raising hasn't been great over the last couple of years. So it's allowed us to really just think about our operations, think about what is scalable, what are we confident in, and then try to get to that next phase on our own, basically. Yeah. Self-funded. How have you integrated AI into what you're doing? Is, is it mostly internal, making your internal processes uh, yeah. more efficient, or are you going to launch it anything external? Um, nothing big on the external AI front in the near future. Um, we've definitely thought about it, Yeah, but 
Yeah, to date, it's more like internal operations. Obviously, we leverage AI where we can to just make our team more efficient. And then also small things that we do, um, small parts of our product, things that help just with the efficiency of the coaching experience or the um, level assessments and um, things like that. Mm -hmm. Yeah, that's interesting. So how do you see this growing and are you focusing on specific states or just like, yeah. How, what is your marketing strategy here? Like wh what do you focus on first? Yeah. So we, um, we started out really leveraging influencers. Uh, my wife is a book blogger. So she had an audience that uh, we leveraged um, from the get go. And, and, and that audience is very receptive, um, you know, obviously to this idea of helping kids learn. Who's your wife? Her name is Jansen and she's uh, a blogger at Everyday Reading. So she does cool. Instagram and a blog. She's like OG. She's been around since 2006 in blogging. That's so cool. And so that was a really huge, helpful way to start out, right? You have uh, an audience already. They trust my wife. She's instrumental as a co-founder in building the right thing that people need and want. And, and then, you know, when we launched, it was kind of crazy. Like we did a pre-launch sale and we were like, if we get 10, maybe 20 people to sign up, we're like, good to go. You know, we'll build this out and, and get going. And when we passed 50, we were just like, whoa, what is going on? And then we passed a hundred people that had said, okay, we're subscribing to at least monthly, actually like 60% of them had subscribed to an annual subscription. And this is like, you know, hundred plus dollars a month sort of thing. Um, and so we knew something was there. We knew there was a need. And uh, anyway, so she was extremely helpful then. She's been extremely helpful throughout. Um, so we've leveraged social media and influencers, more influencers than our own social media. Uh, we need to take some notes from you about how to create a lot of our own. I don't content. know how to do that. <laughs> <laughs> and, uh, and then also we've used... Uh, We've tested paid ads. Um, I don't feel like we've, you know, felt like that's an amazing channel to just make our one and only channel. Uh, I think if you become just a paid ads company, that can be bad over the long run. Sure. So affiliates and, and others are what we're currently testing. We recently hired um, Tony from Neighbor. Who oh, yeah who is awesome. He's one of their, you know, marketing um, gurus who helped neighbor grow from where they were to where they are. And he's just testing everything. And we love having the ability to bring on a new marketing leader to, to really, cause I'm like mediocre at marketing. Tony's like the real deal. Yeah. That's yeah. cool. What have you learned about affiliates? Affiliate marketing is becoming a huge deal. I feel like it's the future. Yeah, I think um, there's a lot of people who create a lot of content on the internet or, um, and, and we kind of differentiate. So influencers is more like your celebrities or maybe social media influencers who are very much more kind of top of the funnel. And then you've got more like the bloggers of the world, the content creators who are sending people through links to go and purchase things. Um, right. We love both of those. And We've worked a fair amount with the influencer crowd because that's who my wife knows. Um, and she kind of straddles both as a OG blogger and also an Instagram, you know, adopter when Instagram came along. So she does both. But um, a lot of people are just social media influencers or like hardcore affiliates. And they're all about creating content online and finding things that people will want that they can you know, divert traffic to mm -hmm. and get paid for that. Um, we actually think that's a, a great way to grow, get your name out there. And so, yeah, I think affiliate is, is a great channel. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, it's really interesting. I've, I've just seen it catching on so much and I've never really understood it to like a, you know, it's this really interesting way of growing a business. Yeah. I mean, if you think about it, like, people are looking for like, you know, recommendations. Yeah. Like Clint, what's, what's your favorite restaurant here? You, you work here in downtown yeah. Provo. 
I want to know where you like to go. Yeah. That will help me decide, right? And if you've got all these online kind of experts in a given area, it makes a lot of sense for mm-hmm. them to start backing certain brands and products and services and be paid for it. And ideally, it's a very authentic experience where they're only backing things that you know people really will benefit from. Yeah. Um, so that's a great model. It's it's kind of just monetizing um, something that's very natural. Yeah. How, uh, uh, how many employees do you have? We have, um, about 20 employees. Wow. That's a lot. Yeah. What have you learned about leadership since like the early days to, you know, growing to a bigger team? Um, how has your leadership style changed? You know, I came into this, um, doing all the things, wearing all the hats and, I was very much a, um, the type of leader who wants people who are proactive and can take on a role and really like improve their position and take on the things that interest them and and grow in it. And that's still how I am. (laughs) What I have noticed is I'm less about like one-on-ones weekly or, you know, kind of the structured managerial thing that I had to do a lot when I was in big tech, for example. And I'm more about the organic, like we're working, we're doing, let's meet when and if necessary. And we're all remote. So, um, you know, there's, I think if I don't see someone for a long time, what that says to me is either they're just crushing it and there's just no decision making that needs my help or anything or that there's maybe not something that's getting done that should be. And so that's when I would be more proactive about reaching out. Luckily, I mean, we really have brought together an amazing team of people who are super proactive, highly conscientious. And, uh, you know, we've had a few kind of misses along the way. Um, but the current team, everybody is just amazing. That's and, cool. and I love that. Um, not to say there's not challenges. No, yeah. But, uh, you know, and I have a co-founder and this is interesting. Like part of leadership is situational, right? As a co-founder, leading together has been really interesting. Um, in the past, before this, I was at Blip. Mm-hmm. You know, I was kind of the third wheel to the two co-founders, Brent and James. And... So it was much more me coming to them and saying, what do you guys think about this? You know, this or that. As a co-founder and co-leader, it's a little different in the sense that it's less me kind of trying to figure out all the things and more me trying to bring together all the thoughts and and then work on it together with someone who's not the same as me Mm -hmm. and who we're not always perfectly aligned. Uh, My co-founder, Jeremy, is amazing and he's an amazing technologist and innovator. Um, we met at Intel and we really liked the complement of each other's kind of um, interests and mm-hmm. expertise, me on kind of the business side and him on technology. And we both understand each other's interests well enough um, that we respect each other, right? And, and can work together. But yeah, I mean, it's been so nice to have someone who really knows AI and not to just be making guesses based on yeah. all the hype and things. And like, he can come in and have a real opinion that I wouldn't be able to have because I don't really understand it as well as, you know, someone like him. Yeah. Um, so leading together like that, it's almost like a marriage <laughs> and it has its challenges, but that's been, uh, r- that's probably the biggest evolution in my leadership growth. My personal journey is just learning how to lead with someone who brings extremely valuable skills and um, expertise that I don't have and then melding those together as leaders. Yeah. What role has Utah played in all of this? How important is that? You know, Utah may be playing a bigger role going forward. Um, My co-founder is in Oregon. And so we've never felt like it's like a Utah based mm-hmm. company per se. We do have m- the majority of our employees here, but they're kind of all over the place. You know, we've got some in the East and the 
Midwest and the West, um, Southwest as well, pretty much every region. Um, but we were just talking about how there is a level of, I don't know, goodness that you can get from having kind of at least some centralized maybe office at some point mm-hmm. or, and, you know, bringing Tony on from neighbor. Um, I recognize that that's like, we're benefiting from neighbor and Tony kind of growing up in that environment. And, and now he has this amazing network from all of his mm-hmm. work there. It's possible that, you know, the next hire comes from his network. And, and I think there is a synergy that can happen if you let it. Mm-hmm. with a location like Utah. Yeah. I love Utah. I came back here because I saw the startup scene was finally really interesting. And I had had plenty of years in kind of big tech and other places to kind of recognize the the value that Utah was creating and the what I didn't want to miss out on really. Yeah, that's cool. Yeah. That's actually way cool. Finally, I end every interview with this question and that is we believe the chances one gives is just as important as the chances one takes. When you hear that, who gave you a chance to get you to where you are today? Oh man, that's a good question. Um, I mean, aside from parents who were phenomenally awesome at just raising me and um, giving me all the chances, I would say I I do have to give a lot of credit to my uncle. Um, he's part of the silicon slopes world is greg warnock at mercado yes and you know his his sons man. jensen and davis like mm-hmm. i've always kind of looked up to greg as this entrepreneur and then venture capitalist who just made things happen and kind of recognized opportunities early and um and really he he taught me about entrepreneurship um and and that just took a hold of my heart. You know, I was just like, that is the coolest thing to build businesses that create value, that um, create this kind of, ideally a business continues to grow and create value. And that's how I think about it, right? Like I, I prefer a business structure to almost anything else because it kind of earns its place, but also continues to grow and create value. Ideally not in super monopolistic fashion. Mm-hmm. Um, But anyway, I look at Greg and I think, you know, he's a guy who has definitely influenced the next generation of his, his children and his nieces and nephews like myself. Um, Yeah. Yeah. Greg's a good guy. Well, so great to meet you. So great to have you in here and uh, congratulations on everything you're doing. Thank you. And I'm sure it's only going to grow from here. So best of luck. Appreciate it. Yeah.